death travel of their last Do they still have the weird, uh, you probably have the kind of Hard pass appointments, please gather now at the stakeout. Again, if you're here for to get your hard pass, please gather now at the stakeout. Thank you.
Two-minute warning to press briefing. Two-minute warning to press briefing. Thank you. Good afternoon. Okay, um, today we have joining us our NEC director, Brian Deese. I was just going to give some brief opening remarks. He'll take some questions and then we'll do a briefing from there. Take it away. All right. Hello, everybody. Hello. It's good to be here today. All right. Hello. <laughs> Enthusiasm, I like that. Um, so uh, I just wanted to uh, spend a couple of minutes on uh, providing some context on where we are in the economic recovery um, and also use some charts, which would be really fun. Um, the, president, uh, uh, the president released a statement uh, earlier today saying that our economy, our, our economic recovery has two components, getting Americans back to work uh, and getting prices and supply chains back to normal. Um, and so I want to provide a little bit of context on uh, our perspective on that issue. So uh, uh, first, today uh, we learned that the number of Americans filing for unemployment insurance fell to its lowest level since 1969. Um, and uh, I will, as I think I have done every time I've come to this podium, reinforce that every time we look at data like this, one week, even one month can be volatile. So we look at the averages and trends. But if you look at the first slide here, you'll see that the trend 
underscores um, that the four-week moving average for uh, initial UI claims is now down by about 75% since the beginning of the year. Um, and another way to think about that is that at the beginning of this year, there were 18 million Americans uh, who were collecting unemployment benefits. Uh, and today, we learned that now that, that number has fallen to fewer than 2 million. So in addition to that consistent trend, we're also seeing a reduction in 16 million Americans who were previously relying on government benefits that have now transitioned off of it. Um, we also learned last week that the unemployment rate fell uh, to 4.2%, uh, which is, again, the fastest year to get a decline in the unemployment rate on record. Um, and in this uh, second chart, you see, uh, there we are. Uh, this, the second chart, you see that that is not only the fastest decline, but it's also very significantly uh, accelerated from what was projected at the beginning of this year. So uh, the, um, the, I guess, mauve, what, what color is that? That, that light brown line. Uh, <laughs> mauve, is that right? <laughs> no, no, okay, okay. <laughs> Getting clear, clear feedback from the front row, and it's not. Um, uh, the brown line, the light brown line, shows the uh, the uh, projections from the beginning of this year prior to the passage of the American Rescue Plan, which showed that or it would it projected to take our economy until uh, the end of 2024 to get to an unemployment rate of about 4.2%. Uh, and now we have reached that in the fourth quarter of 2021, uh, which underscores both the, uh, the significance of the American Rescue Plan in helping drive a strong labor market recovery, but also just the, the, um, the benefit for the American people of reaching that point. Um, I would just note as well, um, in, in terms of uh, labor market strength, that we have also seen encouraging signs in labor force participation, uh, because uh, when the unemployment comes, uh, rate comes down, it can be because people are joining the labor force or coming out. Um, and we saw that the, the prime age employment to pop population ratio, which is the, the, the metric of, uh, that, that economists generally look at, increased by five-tenths of a percent last month. And we've now recovered nearly 85% of our uh, pandemic drop in, um, uh, in that metric. Um, so we've seen very strong labor market developments, and that la those labor market developments are coupled by strong developments in overall uh, economic growth um, and in household income and uh, demand. And so that puts us in a position where today, real household income um, is higher than before the pandemic. So real household income for the typical American family is $350 a month higher now than before the pandemic in real terms, uh, accounting for price increases, accounting for inflation. Um, and so that strength, that strength of the labor market, that strength of household balance sheets, that strength of economic growth positions us uniquely well to deal with the challenges that we face of prices and supply chain issues. In fact, uniquely among uh, industrialized countries, we are the only country that has seen GDP now recover from its pre-pandemic levels, has seen household income recover from its pre-pandemic levels. So that positions us uniquely well. Um, and so on that note, we are, um, as you all know, very focused on addressing the issue of prices and supply chain uh, bottlenecks uh, head on uh, uh, from that position uh, of strength. Tomorrow, we will get data on consumer prices for uh, November. Um, and uh, uh, I'm not going to attempt uh, to predict uh, what those data are. Uh, outside forecasters uh, expect those data to continue to show price increases at, to remain at elevated levels. Um, but I want to provide a little bit of context on that uh, front as well. Um, the first is that that data uh, is by definition backward looking, um, and so it won't capture some recent price movements, um, uh, particularly in the area of energy. Um, and so, for example, uh, prices of gas at the gas pump are now down nationally. Um, they're down about uh, uh, nine cents. Um, but to get, put some context on that, this next chart over here, this shows the, uh, the inflation-adjusted real uh, price of gas at the pump uh, over the last uh, 10 years. And what it shows is that, um, on average, uh, over the last uh, uh, 10 years, and in fact, this is true over the last 20 years, um, the average price at the pump uh, for a gallon of gas has been about $3.13 in real terms, inflation adjusted. And so today, 
Uh, 20 states now have pump prices that are below that 20-year average. Um, and as, uh, the, as prices come down nationally um, at, over the next a couple of weeks, as we expect um, and hope that they will, uh, we hope to see more states uh, falling into that category. Um, those price reductions will not be reflected in, in, uh, in the data for uh, uh, November. Um, in addition, this week we've seen natural gas prices fall. Um, they're now down 25% from their average in November. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, that is good news, particularly looking into the winter uh, home heating season. I know several of you uh, reported on and were focused on uh, natural gas price increases earlier this fall, uh, portending potentially big increases in, uh, in heating costs over the winter. The very dramatic decline in natural gas prices over the course of the last couple of weeks have changed that outlook uh, uh, quite uh, meaningfully. Um, so these declines uh, are delivering, most importantly, some, some benefit to uh, consumers uh, and some benefits to consumers on a, on a go-forward basis uh, that won't be reflected uh, in that data. Uh, secondly, we've seen some near movements on other commodity prices uh, over the course of the last couple of weeks. We've seen shipping costs uh, to move a, a container from Asia to the United States come down by about 25% uh, over the course of the last couple of weeks. The price of wheat, the price of pork um, um, has come down, and importantly, used cars as well. I know many of you have seen and tracked in some of the recent uh, um, price data that used cars have played an outsized influence. There's been challenges in the used car market, in, including uh, relating to uh, reflecting the fact that rental car companies sold off their fleets and were buying back. Um, we anticipate that uh, some of the recent decline in used car prices at the wholesale level uh, indicates that we would, may see prices decline there as well. Again, that won't be reflected uh, in, uh, uh, in backward-looking data from tomorrow. Um, and lastly, uh, the consensus estimates of outside experts continue to uh, per forecast and project that price increases will moderate uh, going into 2022. Um, the blue chip consensus for core PCE inflation, for example, in, by the fourth quarter of next year is down to 2.2%, uh, um, uh, uh, for example. Um, so yeah, so that's, I think, important context for all of you in thinking about um, the, uh, the data uh, releases. But most importantly, from our perspective, it is a reason to redouble our efforts to focus on both the immediate term and the medium term steps that we can take to try to address uh, prices and bring down costs for uh, families. That's what we're focused on with respect to our supply chain work, uh, our energy uh, price work, and, and of course, in moving the Build Back Better uh, Act. Uh, which will do more um, than any piece of legislation in modern American history to reduce costs for families. So with that, I will Kristen, open the floor. Pick it up. Thank you, Jen, and Brian, thank you for being here. Um, jumping off right there on Build Back Better, as you anticipate and wait for this new data tomorrow, and I think there's also going to be a new cost estimate of Build Back Better requested by Republicans, how concerned is the White House that it will complicate your efforts to win over those moderate Democrats like Joe Manchin? Well, we are quite confident uh, that if the question is what can we do to address the costs that are most pressing to American families? That, that if that is the debate and that is the discussion, then um, the case for the Build Back Better Act um, is only gets stronger, um, and that we are uh, building momentum around uh, that set of arguments. Um, if you step back and you think about a typical family's budget, um, and what they have to spend on expenses in a typical month. About 60% of those costs fall into uh, housing, health care, prescription drugs, child care, and transportation. That's what you know, the bulk of a family's budget uh, yeah, is made up of. And on each of those areas, the legislation that the president has prioritized and is moving through Congress would address and reduce those costs. And so I think that if, um, if, if that's the debate and that's the question, how can we address those costs that families are facing? Again, the Build Back Better Act it will do more to lower costs than any piece of legislation uh, in modern American history. And so we feel um, quite um, you know, enthusiastic about being able to make that case. Well, one quick follow on inflation. Fed Chair Jerome Powell said that transitory is no longer the right way to describe inflation. He said it now appears that factors pushing inflation upward will linger well into next year. 
given that, do you believe that this inflation is now more entrenched and not transitory? What we, what we, what we believe is that price increases elevated at the level that we're seeing um, hit American families in their pocketbooks, and we need to do everything that we can to address those directly. Um, we also believe that the strength of our economic recovery, the strength of our labor market, and the strength of wage increases and the steps that we've taken to try to provide some relief to American families position our economy and American households uniquely well to address what is a global uh, issue uh, around uh, price increases in the context of supply chains and otherwise. But is Powell right? Will these increased prices last through next year? Well, I, I, I am not going to get into uh, the prediction business other than to say, and I'll echo what I, what I, uh, what I noted at the, be at the beginning, is that most outside independent forecasters uh, continue to see price increases moderating and moderating meaningfully over the course of next year. Mary? Uh, along the same line, the President did try to set expectations in his statement today saying you know, expect inflation numbers to stay high, to stay high but that, that doesn't reflect the reality. So when do you expect the reports will actually reflect this? Well, I would just point to some of the real world, you know, uh, real world data that we're seeing, which is that we've seen uh, we've seen gas prices come down, we've seen natural gas prices come down, um, we've seen uh, we've seen real progress in unsticking some of the supply chain uh, bottlenecks uh, that uh, that have been that have persisted uh, in uh, in our economy. I was you know, noting on supply chains that there's actually now some reporting that that the principal concern is on the back end of uh, the holiday season. Uh, too much excess inventory, and people have uh, uh, overordered. And so, uh, so certainly these are not, you know, the, these are these are things that don't work themselves out overnight. Um, and and we, I will go back to what I said uh, at the beginning of this. We never over-index on any one piece of data um, or uh, any one uh, uh, data release. Um, but we, you know, we're going to stay focused on what we can do to try to address these prices in the immediate term. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jen. Um, uh, just talking about sort of gas prices coming down, uh, Brian, uh, a group of uh, bipartisan lawmakers, uh, six of them from Texas, uh, as you're probably aware, sent a letter to President Biden uh, about not reinstituting a ban on uh, U.S. Uh, oil exports. Uh, what is the position of the White House on that, uh, con considering the letter was sent um, explicitly saying that the White House is considering uh, a move to that effect? It's not an issue that we're currently focused on. Uh, the President, uh, in our focus on energy markets, um, has made clear to the team that all options should be on the table to try to address um, challenges in the market and bring uh, relief to American consumers. That's certainly the approach that we have taken to date in our international uh, engagements, our diplomatic engagements, and actions we've taken, including the uh, exchange and sale from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve that the President announced about 10 days ago. Uh, so we will we'll continue to work on those issues. We'll continue to work with states and localities to make sure that they have the uh, support that they need. But that, that, that specific issue is not one that we're currently focused on. Sorry, just a quick, uh, quick follow-up. Um, in terms of sort of your overall, um, you know, um, economic growth sort of forecasts from the White House, you know, given the fact that the the Omicron variant is spreading uh, rapidly, uh, some economists have started uh, factoring in a, sort of a slowdown in demand and you know uh, for services and hiring in general. Uh, what are sort of your expectations uh, just for, for, uh, over the next few quarters uh, in terms of sort of overall economic? growth in the U.S.? Well, we, like others, are obviously tracking very closely uh, the questions raised by the, uh, the Omicron variant uh, and are um, waiting and watching the information um, as we receive it uh, with, uh, and with the understanding that we need to know more, um, but we are learning some. We've seen some encouraging um, data coming out recently. Uh, but it's something that we will continue to uh, monitor closely uh, and study closely in, in terms of, you know, the current uh, growth. Uh, currently, um, all indications are that the uh, economy in the fourth quarter continues to grow robustly, um, and uh, we certainly expect that uh, to, uh, to continue. And, and our focus is on how we can maintain the strength of the overall economic a recovery, the strength of the labor market recovery, while also addressing head on um, these uh, these price challenges uh, uh, and these supply chain bottlenecks. And to be very clear, that, that the, the risk oh, it, it exists that price increases become entrenched in the long term. That's something that would be a real problem for the economy. We are working in, uh, in, in looking forward and don't see that um, 
uh, in the current uh, environment, but are you know focused on the steps that we can take to drive that kind of robust recovery going forward. Thank you, Jen, and thank you, Brian. Just a quick follow up on Build Back Better, and then one on unemployment. Given how um, involved you are with negotiations, what is the most viable timeline right now for passing it, and is before Christmas still realistic? So. Um, we want to move as quickly as possible, uh, and we uh, are working very closely with Senator Schumer and the, and the entire uh, caucus on uh, facilitating that outcome. And uh, Senator Schumer has, has indicated his, uh, uh, his intention, his timeline, and we're uh, both supportive of that and believe that that's, uh, uh, that's right and viable. We want to move as quickly as possible here. We think that the, that the outstanding issues are um, getting worked through uh, in the process. We're making a lot of progress. Um, so uh, so we're, uh, we, we want to move as quick as possible, and we believe there's every reason why we can. Um, and in terms of unemployment, the system now, and I think you referenced this earlier, doesn't account for gig workers and self-employed who were on uninsure, unemployment insurance, but then they ran out um, if they were pandemic related. So is there any way you're tracking the number of those people who might not be included in the numbers but might still be struggling? And is there anything that you can do to help them? So. The, uh, there's sort of uh, two, two, uh, two elements of that question. The first is that um, there were people who were previously receiving unemployment insurance uh, are no longer receiving unemployment insurance are obviously not reflected in the, the UI claims. And these reflect the people who are receiving government assistance. And that has come down dramatically, as I said, from uh, 18 million to less than 2 million. Within that category, people who were on unemployment insurance um, and, uh, and, then, uh, and, then, and then come off unemployment insurance, the way to track that data is really to look at the labor force data. Because um, th those people could either be in the labor force, actively looking for a job, or they could be employed, or they could end up out of the labor force. And so one of the things, uh, from an economic point of view, one of the concerns that you have is to track the labor force participation. Because if people come off of unemployment, but they leave the labor force entirely, then that's, a, that's an outcome that you, 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 uh, you, want, you hope to avoid. So that one of the positive indications in our current labor market is that what we're seeing is even as the number of people receiving unemployment insurance has come down dramatically. Labor force participation has stayed steady and started to tick up, which suggests that people are coming back into the labor market, finding jobs in many cases, or are actively looking for jobs. But that's the sort of best proxy to get at what I think you're trying to refer to. Thank you. Um, Brian, some of the critics, administration's critics, have said over the last few months, as these reports come out and show inflation is rising, that the administration highlighting the bright spots, like unemployment, is glossing over the reality that people are paying more for food and things, basic necessities. Um, and a lot of the people who are impacted the most are the poorest or they're on fixed incomes. They might not be moved by an unemployment statistic. So what's your message to those people, especially getting closer to the midterms? Yeah, absolutely. And and just to be very clear, the, the, uh, the issue of, uh, you know, increased prices hits people in very practical ways in their lives. And uh, no one likes to pay more at the gas pump. Nobody likes to pay more at the grocery store. And for people who are um, uh, you know, a lower income, it, could be, it, um, it can be tough. I think my, the message is that um, uh, employment and our labor market are really important uh, uh, ways in which people can seek and find economic opportunity and prosperity. And the fact that wages are increasing the most for people in the bottom 40% of the income distribution is something that hasn't happened in our economy in some time. And it's really positive because what it means is that there are more job opportunities and job opportunities at higher wages for people uh, to move into. That's point one. Point two is that in terms of household income and their balance sheets, if you look at the bottom 25% uh, or the bottom 40% of households, and you look at both the increase in wages that people have received and the, the benefits that people have received because in the American Rescue Plan, for example, um, we passed a child tax credit that is now going to families on a monthly basis. Uh, we provided checks to people uh, in there. Uh, uh, and you look in the aggregate, household income for those people in the lower ends of the income spectrum is actually higher today 
on a monthly basis, even when you take into account increased uh, inflation. So that's not true for every person, and, then, and, and every individual has uh, uh, challenges, and we, um, we want to speak to all of those. But in terms of overall, economically speaking, um, because of the strength of the, the economic recovery, the strength of the labor market, and the support that we've provided over the course of the year, um, people are better positioned today to deal with these challenges, which are real and which are tough, and which is why we're focused every day on what we can do to try to alleviate them. Does the administration see uh, inflation as a, a, a driving need to extend the child tax credit? Uh, the our, uh, our 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 view is that the child tax credit is a uh, you know a really important basic support for families and that we uh, we we should extend it and we should extend it because it's doing what we um, hoped it would do, uh, which is dramatically reduce child poverty uh, in America, dramatically reduce poverty in America, and give uh, families uh, some breathing room uh, uh, in a very strong but uncertain recovery. So um, certainly it's the president's position that um, we should do that. And we can do that. I would, I would just underscore, we can do that as part of Build Back Better in a way that is fiscally responsible, fully paid for, won't in add to any inflationary pressures in the economy. Heather? Yes, thanks. Um, Frank, can you give us any timing on when the president may name additional Fed nominees? Is that process drawing to a close? Could we see something next week? <laughs> I cannot. <laughs> Josh? Um, you uh, alluded to the forecast for tomorrow's number. Uh, you know, I may even want to name any, so allow me. Great. 6.8% uh, <laughs> is our median estimate year over year. That's higher than last time, last month with the 6.2. The month over month figure is 0 0.7 or 0.9. So in other words, they're sort of showing different things. Year over year is getting worse, month over month getting better. My question for you is where are we, do you think, in the arc of inflation right now? You've referenced forecasts bringing it down by Q4. Do you think the way it's cresting, when you talk about backward looking data, do you think the inflation is leveling off, the data aren't just capturing yet, or do you think it's going to get worse before it gets better? So. Uh, a couple of points. Uh, first, I'm not going to try to predict or project. Um, I, I, your your projection is an aggregated estimate of a lot of people who have thought about this, and I'm not going to get into the projection game. We obviously do our own um, uh, estimates. Uh, the s second is you, you raise an important point. I think this is good context for in, in, in the you know in anticipation of it, which is because of the, what we have seen over the course of the last 12 months or 11 months, the year over year headline uh, uh, number. Um, will be elevated compared to you know uh, historic uh, levels under any circumstances. That's baked in, um, and that's largely a function. Well, that is 100% a function of everything that happened uh, starting before November of, uh, of this year. Uh, so, in in a sense, the that year over year um, uh, is it should be taken with that context. Um, in terms of your question about you know uh, the timing, I think that we are in a place where we are seeing some of the uh, when you look at what are the underlying uh, issues that are driving this pr price pressures, we are seeing some some movement that is notable. You know, as I've spoken about on energy, um, with respect to the supply chains, and our um, our, our our focus is on looking tracking that across time because we think that that will be what will end up flowing through to affect those. Um, uh, those numbers uh, across time. This is not, you know, I, I, I would not try to project on a, you know, week or month by month basis because this, because these numbers move around. You know, I mentioned used car prices, and a lot of people focus on what's happening at the wholesale uh, markets uh, uh, when dealers are buying used cars because that is really an indication of where the prices are going. But that could take, you know, a month or two to uh, to filter through into data. So in e each of these cases, there are specific elements. We'll continue to look closely at them. But I think you have seen, you are seeing in some important areas um, some movement that is notable. Do you think the wave is cresting or is it too soon to say? You know, we will, we'll just, we'll, we're going to continue to focus on what we can do uh, to advance this recovery uh, and advance this recovery in a way where, you know, typical households continue to have uh, some of that breathing room and uh, more Americans are able to take advantage of a job market where there are, you know, historic opportunities out there. Uh, uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, just two quick ones, if you don't mind. One of the concerns last month on you know, the top line numbers was that perhaps it was broadening out a little bit. You know, I'm thinking particularly not just pandemic-driven uh, price increases, but maybe rent uh, being one specifically. Have you guys seen anything in that side of things not driven by the pandemic that has raised concerns as you've looked at the data? 
Well, I, I'm glad you raised uh, this issue and uh, around um, housing and, and, and shelter prices, uh, shelter being you know either rent or, 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 or homes, um, because I think it connects to a point that, that Kristen, you raised, which is um, we have for years in this country had a, um, a problem of inadequate housing supply of single family homes to buy uh, and uh, of, of, of houses to rent. Um, it is a decades uh, in the making um, of underinvestment uh, in affordable supply, particularly in areas of the country where there is the most economic opportunity. And so it's a persistent challenge of people wanting to move to, you know, a different part of the country where they might have a job opportunity and are, are, are costed out of that because of housing. The answer to that problem is to make a historic investment in increasing the supply of affordable housing in America. That is the real answer to that question. And the sooner that we do that, the sooner that we initiate that process, the sooner that we are going to actually address that underlying challenge. Uh, and so some of the price increases that are, are already baked in and will uh, flow through to this, uh, to, uh, to these numbers. We uh, know that everyone should anticipate that. But the real policy question, it goes to why Build Back Better is so important, is are we going to actually take some steps to finally address that issue so that we can say to the American people that looking forward, they can actually expect some real relief. The housing investments in the Build Back Better plan are directed exactly to, to, to that issue. How do we build the kind of housing supply that, that typical people uh, need across the country in urban, suburban, and in rural areas? And so um, that, is, that's a, that is a real present issue, one that will continue to be with us. But hopefully, if we can get this bill done, we'll actually have the tools in place to start to show people some real progress. And then just from a broader perspective, do you guys view it inside your team as an acceptable trade-off if prices are high for a shorter duration, a shorter period of time, perhaps because of some of the demand-driven uh, elements of ARP, so long as you've been able to achieve some of the uh, some of the data, positive data you've been laying out over the course of this day, and I think the White House has been talking about for the last seven months. Like this, this is a trade-off that's acceptable so long as those price increases don't last or become entrenched. Um. Well, I would start. We, we were uh, we're uh, humble enough to not uh, suggest that we we control all the levers of the macro economy, and, and uh, we're in a complicated, uncertain global environment. And number one, number two, I think that uh, um, our view, and and I think b borne out by what you're seeing internationally, is that uh, the challenges of um, supply chains, of price increases, of, uh, um, of, of the issues of labor supply are persistent across industrialized countries. But what's unique about the United States right now is the strength of our economic growth, the strength of our labor market. And that is in no small part due to um, uh, the American Rescue Plan. So we're absolutely um, you know, uh, not satisfied or want to accept a situation where Americans are paying high prices um, uh, when they can't uh, afford it. I think where we are in this economy is one where we have real strength, um, and that positions us to address real challenges that, that, um, that, we, uh, that we need to. Do a few more. April. Um, I want to go back to the child tax credit. December 15th could be that last check if BBB is not passed for the child tax credit. If it's not passed, what does that do to this child poverty rate that you have been touting so much, how you slashed it? Does it stay the same, or do you anticipate a rise with that? Well, uh, we are uh, confident that we're going to get Build Back Better passed. Uh, extending the child tax credit is one of many reasons why we need to do that, and uh, we need to do that um, as soon as possible. Uh, and uh, And so, that's why you see this administration uh, as focused as we are on working uh, with our congressional uh, counterparts to move uh, to move that agenda. Um, there are uh, there are multiple elements of this bill where, if you look at costs and you look at how you know typical household situations, the urgency is very clear. This is one. The lack of affordable housing is another. The lack of affordable child care is another that is not a tomorrow issue for so many families that are trying to figure out how to get uh, 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 somebody back into the labor market. And so we're, you know, that's, that's the case we're making, and, that's, and we're confident we're going to get this done. And then on housing, can you talk about the price of new housing as well as existing housing? Uh, 
part of the problem they're saying with uh, housing prices, new housing prices, it deals with inflation and lumber. The cost of lumber has pushed up the price of housing and the supply chain issue. How in the short term do you plan to combat as you combat that as you're dealing with the housing issue and talking about affordable housing? Houses to buy right now are up because of inflation, supply chain, supply chain issues. Yeah, I'm, so it, it, it's, it's connected to Phil's question. You know, the the um, prices in the in the in the residential market are 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 are, are elevated. Um, but a lot of that is is a, is a supply issue. Supply issue is in, in part connected to near-term supply chain issues, but it is much deeper and longer term about uh, years and years in which we've underinvested in supply compared to the demand that in the economy um, for uh, uh, for housing, particularly in certain uh, regions and geographies. The supply chain challenges that uh, are affecting uh, the inputs that go into uh, home building um, are. Um, similar to the supply chain issues we're facing overall, um, but we've tried to take a dedicated focus in a number of areas. So, for example, um, we have an hours of service waiver for trucks that move across the country to be able to uh, operate additional hours. We extended that to cover uh, building materials um, uh, as well. The issue of helping to move uh, a product through our ports is very important, uh, uh, particularly for building materials that are being imported. So, um, so you know, we were, we're, we're focused on the supply chain issues in general, but as they relate to building materials wherever they can, we're trying to highlight them. All right, let's do Kayla and Courtney, and then I'm gonna wrap it up, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Jen, thank you, Brian. Um, my first question is on Russia. The US and European allies have like severe harm on Russia if it escalates the situation in Ukraine. As you and the White House know, the economy is global. It is intertwined, especially the energy market. And European consumers are already paying record costs to heat their homes this winter. So I'm wondering how the administration is thinking about mitigating the impact on the US economy with whatever decisions you decide to take with regard to sanctions. So I will leave the question of sanctions and the impact on our European counterparts to Jake and to Jen. Uh, I think they've spoken to them um, uh, and the sort of dynamic involved there, um, including as it, as it relates to Nord Stream. With respect to U.S. consumers, um, the, the natural gas in particular um, is an issue that uh, is, is, a, is a commodity that doesn't trade uh, globally. And so uh, the decline that I referenced earlier, 25 percent uh, decline in natural gas prices since uh, November, that's the price of U.S. Uh, natural gas, um, which is about, I, I, I haven't looked in the last uh, day, but it, you know, four to five times lower uh, than in Europe. Um, and that's uh, for a set of reasons, the export, constraint, export constraints. Um, but in terms of the American consumer, um, uh, in looking forward to this winter, uh, they, there's some um, Positive news in terms of domestic natural gas, and not a lot of um, not a lot of flow through to the issues you're raising. And on wages, um, just to follow up uh, domestically, I think uh, the average American would find inflation more manageable if wages were also going up. And in the last year, inflation-adjusted weekly earnings are down 1.3 percent. So when can Americans expect to earn more money for the work that they're already doing? Yeah, uh, it's a uh, uh, it's a, a good question and good context to connect to to uh, the uh, earlier question as well. So, uh, if you look at um, if you look at wage growth, uh, uh, it's important to look at it through a, a couple of uh, a couple of lenses. The first is where is that wage growth happening in the income uh, spectrum, and what you're seeing is wage growth today that is fastest and strongest in the bottom half of the income distribution. So for working families that are making uh, less, they're seeing their wages increase uh, more, um, and in, 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 in many cases, significantly faster than price increases. Um, so that's, uh, that's point one distributionally. The second is in terms of overall household balance sheets, the income that families have. And when you think about a family and they're them trying to balance their checkbook, or, or um, the, the, this year, the question is, what was my wage increase and what was the, uh, what was the support that I received through checks from the government, uh, uh, through the child tax credit? And when you take those into account and look at household income, uh, consistent with the data that you just said, the typical family, the family you know, at the, 50, uh, the 50th percentile, 
um, has actually seen their household income increase, even accounting for price uh, increases. And obviously, as we move forward in this recovery, what we want to see is we want to see a strong labor market recovery. We want to see wage uh, uh, increases, uh, uh, particularly for those uh, at the bottom. And we want to see a, you know, a balancing out here um, of prices. That's the scenario that we're all trying to work toward. Courtney, last one. Can you give an update on the competition council that you're chairing? It's something I didn't hear you mention in the context of all of this. It's you said it's something that's what? Competition council. Louder. The competition yeah. council. You never mentioned it in all of this. Can you talk about some of the accomplishments of that council and what you all are working on right now? Sure, sure. I'm, I'm excited for the interest. Um, and we will have, uh, I'm, I don't mean that, I mean that sincerely. Settle in, everyone. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, I mean that sincerely. Uh, so, uh, uh, and we will be um, we'll be convening the full council around the end of the year, um, and so uh, uh, look out for that. Um, uh, it's uh, it's um, I could talk about some of the specifics, but I will say that actually, you know, it's it, it's consistent with a general philosophy that does interact with a lot of the things that we were discussing here, which is that the president's. The core directive in the in um, in the executive order was to pursue pro competition policies um, across uh, the federal government, across agencies, and use antitrust uh, um, statutes, enforce them robustly um, um, across uh, agencies as well. And so this intersects with a number of the issues uh, that we've discussed. I would note positively that the um, that the House this week passed a bill on. Uh, increasing competition in ocean uh, uh, sh uh, shipping, uh, 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 which is something that we um, encouraged uh, um, as part of that uh, executive order. But more, more, you know, more directly, um, you take uh, an issue like the uh, railroads um, and the you know lack of competition uh, in that sector. Well, that affects this question of how do we unstick bottlenecks if there's not sufficient competition among uh, among rail lines. We talk about food prices, and I think the last time I was here, I was with Secretary Vilsack. Um, when you look at most of the um, the increase in uh, food costs, you can isolate a significant portion of that to um, uh, meat, uh, beef, pork, and chicken in particular, those are very concentrated industries where a small number of meat processors control um, the, uh, the industry. And so what you've seen is prices for the, the farmers uh, go up, prices for consumers go up, um, and, uh, um, and, uh, and profits for the meat processing uh, I, uh, companies in the middle um, go up. And that's an issue of concern and one that we have focused on both from an antitrust perspective, but also investing in helping competitors get into that market. Uh, in fact, today we were, we're making $500 million available to small uh, uh, meat processors to try to increase competition uh, in that space. So we'd be happy to follow up and give you a full slate of where we are on the, there were, for those of you who are paying attention, there were 72 specific uh, actions in that executive order. Um, we are tracking against the all of them. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but I will spare the rest of you uh, that, and we are happy to follow up. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. I definitely kept him much longer than I promised, so we want him to come back. Um, all right, so I only have one item for all of you at the top. Uh, as I think all of you saw this morning, or many of you saw, uh, this morning the President opened the Summit for Democracy and announced the Presidential Initiative for Democratic Renewal, a landmark set of policy and foreign assistance initiatives to defend and bolster democracy, human rights, and the fight against corruption. The initiative represents a significant targeted expansion of U.S. government efforts to defend, sustain, and grow democratic resilience with like-minded governmental and non-governmental partners. In the coming year, the United States is planning to provide up to $424.4 million toward the initiative. And these efforts will center on five areas of work crucial to the functioning of transparent, accountable governance, including supporting free and independent media, fighting corruption, bolstering democratic reformers, advancing technology for democracy, defending free and fair elections and political processes. I know we'll also have a call this afternoon, I'm not sure exactly the time uh, to give you more uh, information on the deliverables from this as well. Colleen, why don't you kick us off or continue our journey here together? Thank you. Um, do you have an update for us on uh, the President's call with Zelensky? And um, another one just sort of related, sort of. Um, there were a couple of 
reports last night about a potential financial threat or potential military action um, to Iran in regards to the faltering nuclear talks. I wondered if you had a comment or update on that. Sure. Uh, let me start with the first. When I came out here, the President was still on the call, so our plan was to provide a written readout to all of you, uh, which you should be getting as soon as it's complete or following the briefing whenever it's ready. Uh, but I will uh, highlight for you that the President's intention going into this call was to provide an update for President Zelensky on his call with President Putin and underscore our support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, uh, as Secretary Blinken did when he spoke with President Zelensky earlier this week. So this is a follow-on to that call. Uh, President Biden is also intending to, was intending to discuss his deep concerns with Russia's buildup on Ukraine's borders and his commitment to respond with strong measures in the event of a Russian military escalation. Uh, we've engaged closely with the Ukrainians throughout this process at a range of levels and have been in daily contact with senior officials in the Ukrainian government. So clearly that is a component of it. I'd also note, I think as many of you saw, that the President also provided an update to uh, the B9 eastern flank countries with a personal readout of his call with President Putin uh, to hear their perspectives on the current security situation and underscore our commitment to transatlantic security and to uh, our NATO allies that are – with our NATO allies is sacred and also to continue to stay in close coordination. Uh, on the, but we will get you um, a readout as soon as that is complete. Uh, on the Iran question that you also posed second, I do have an update for you. Uh, as we've said many times from this podium and elsewhere in the government, uh, President Biden is committed to ensuring Iran never acquires a nuclear weapon and believes diplomacy in coordination with allies and regional partners is the best path to achieve that goal. We believe a diplomatic resolution offers the best, best path to avoiding a nuclear crisis. Uh, however, uh, given the ongoing advances in Iran's nuclear program, the President has asked his team to be prepared in the event that diplomacy fails. And we must turn to other options, and that requires preparations. Uh, we have made clear to Iran that the only path out of sanctions is through nuclear compliance. We have kept all the sanctions that we inherited in place, and we have consistently enforced sanctions, all while also presenting the clear path of their removal. If diplomacy cannot get on track soon, and if Iran's nuclear program continues to accelerate, then we will have no choice but to take additional measures to further restrict Iran's revenue-producing sectors. While I'm not going to get into additional specifics on that front, I can provide you a little update on some of the coordination that we're doing on the international – on an, the international front. Uh, a senior Treasury official uh, will lead a Treasury State delegation to the UAE next week to talk about sanctions compliance. The delegation, which will be led by OFAC Director Andrea Gacki will focus on engagements with the private sector and key UAE government officials to discuss our understanding of the companies and financial institutions that facilitate non-compliant Iranian commerce that runs through or touches the UAE. This trip follows a range of conversations that our National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and Brett McGurk had in, in October, that uh, obviously Rob Malley and Brett McGurk had in November, and Deputy Treasury Secretary Adeyama also had in November. Uh, and this is uh, part of our uh, extended outreach to our partners around the world to ensure that we are preparing for a range of contingencies. Do you have a timeline on, you know, how long diplom the diplomacy is going to continue before we have to resort to other actions? I'm not going to present a deadline today, but what I can tell you is that uh, we have presented a diplomatic path forward. Uh, that path is still open, uh, but based on the outcome of the last round of talks and the ongoing advancements in Iran's nuclear facilities, we are laying the path for uh, the groundwork for another path entirely. Uh, so it's just meant to be preparations. Go ahead. Uh, the president said he hoped to announce by tomorrow meetings between Russia and NATO allies about Russia's concerns. Do you have any update on that meeting and who may be attending? I, I think what the president was referring to is uh, a range of uh, discussions and engagements that we're continuing to have today. The B9 as an example of that. Obviously, there are a number of NATO partners involved there. And of course, we will, uh, while well, I have nothing to preview at this point, the president, two presidents has their teams to follow up, uh, and we expect that to continue as well. So it was not meant to be an ind indication of a deal cut, concessions made, any formal format or anything along those lines, more about the commitment to ongoing engagement. And you said you, know, you don't know what Vladimir Putin's next move is here. It's not clear yet whether he's made up his mind whether or not uh, to invade Ukraine. But uh, 
just how the Russian president said the situation in southeast Ukraine resembles genocide. That was how he described it. Is that something that you would view as a rhetorical escalation? Uh, well, the Russians are known for their rhetorical escalations, uh, as they are also known for their uh, ways of, uh, of providing misinformation uh, around the world uh, and within eastern flank countries. So I think we have to take uh, their own efforts to communicate to their public with a grain of salt. Uh, what we know is that uh, the aggression here is on the Russian side. The military buildup is on the Russian side. Uh, there is a path, a diplomatic path forward. Uh, the part of the president's objective, our president's objective in having the call was to convey that clearly. That certainly is our preference, but also to convey clearly that there would be consequences, they would be significant and severe, and we're going to coordinate with our European partners on that. So I would, uh, unfortunately, as I've said before, not a spokesperson for the Kremlin, and I would take uh, their, their words with a little bit of a grain of salt. Go ahead. Thank you, Jen. Uh, just a quick question on um, Ukraine's ask to become a member of the NATO uh, alliance. I and mean, they've, they've put that out for several years. It's been mm -hmm. out there, but really has there hasn't been any decision on that. What is the United States' position on that issue? I mean, does the, does the president generally support the enlargement of NATO, or does he does he want uh, the alliance to add new members? What is his position? Well, and indeed, the president has spoken to this in the past, and obviously there are requirements that any country, which the President certainly supports, any country aspiring to join security alliances, NATO and others as well, and he certainly supports the aspiration of Ukraine. There are certain requirements that they would need to meet uh, on a range of issues, including corruption and other topics, and it's obviously up to NATO partner countries and NATO, uh, the alliance, to determine uh, what the path forward looks like. As the sort of the biggest member of the alliance, the largest member of the alliance, what is the U.S. telling NATO on this issue specifically? And is the president perhaps offering any assurances to uh, President Zelensky today as he speaks to him on this issue? No, the president's message has been clear. There, are, there, are, he certainly supports uh, the aspiration of Ukraine as he supports the aspiration of a range of countries, again, to join security alliances around the world. There are certain requirements that need to be met. Those are well known, and the United States, as a member of NATO, supports that path. Um, okay. Sorry, a quick question on the Senate passage of the Republican bill um, uh, yesterday to overturn uh, President Biden's vaccine mandate for private employers. Um, are you concerned, that given sort of the Democratic support that that um, a bill actually was able to get, are you concerned that it perhaps uh, will actually uh, be able to, you know, interest some centrist House Democrats to maybe join? in and, you know, and, and, and secure a vote on that. I understand the White House has said that, you know, you will veto the resolution if it lands on the president's desk. Well, I think what's most important for people to know out there and to understand is the reason why the president proposed uh, these requirements, which include not just a vaccine requirement, but also a testing option, testing once a week, which we feel, and I think the American people feel, is quite reasonable in order to keep workplaces safe, keep schools safe, keep uh, stores safe, where people are out there Christmas shopping and holiday shopping safe. Uh, we also know that it's something, it's steps that economists support, it's steps that 60 percent of businesses have already put in place. So again, we're hopeful that this doesn't come to the president's desk. Uh, I I can't make a prediction of that. I'd, I'd leave that to the vote counters or the whip counters uh, in, in the House. But if it comes to his desk, he will veto it. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, apart from whatever President Zelensky might have asked the President for today, can you clarify what Ukraine has formally requested of the U.S. as they prepare for any potential invasion? Have they requested support for air and naval defense or electronic war warfare, as an example? Well, we're not going to get into specifics of private requests made through diplomatic and defense channels uh, from the Ukrainian government. If they want to speak to that, they certainly can speak to that. Uh, I would note that there were requests, there have been requests made over the course of time, and the United States has provided uh, over the course of some time now, I guess, uh, 400 billion, I believe this is correct, 400 million, sorry, billion would be a lot, uh, $400 million in security assistance that we've committed uh, to Ukraine this year as a part of our efforts to support their sovereignty and territorial integrity. And that includes $60 million of security assistance that we announced during uh, the President's uh, visit in September, which we're still providing, we're still delivering to the Ukrainians. So in terms of their specific requests, what they have, want to convey privately, if they want to convey that publicly, that is certainly their prerogative, but we would not do that on their behalf. And the head of Ukraine's military intelligence service 
is quoted in the New York Times saying, there are not sufficient military resources for repelling a full-scale attack by Russia if it begins without the support of Western forces. Has Ukraine expressed a similar sentiment to the administration, and do you have a response? Again, I'm not going to get into private diplomatic conversations, but I will convey to you, and what, what the President would convey, has conveyed, I'm sure is conveying directly to uh, President Zelensky. Our objective is to uh, make clear uh, the significant and severe economic consequences if Russia were to invade Ukraine, not just from us, but from the global community. Obviously, it's up to President Putin to decide uh, how he's going to respond to that, what steps he may or may not take as it relates to that. But I think what the uh, public should see clearly, whether it's the Ukrainian public or the global public, uh, is that the United States is standing up for what we believe are democratic values, for the territorial uh, the, the sovereignty of, of Ukraine, and our objective is to prevent that from happening. And one more point on vaccines. Um, based on conversations Pfizer has had with the administration, should Americans be mentally preparing for a fourth shot? Uh, I would point you really to what the CDC and our health and medical experts have conveyed. And they will continue to evaluate and assess what is needed for the American people and to keep people safe. Uh, but I don't want to get ahead of their reviews of data. Go ahead, Jackie. Thanks, Jen. Um, on vaccines, uh, Amtrak, which we know is near and dear to the President's heart, uh, announced that they will potentially have to cut some long distance routes. Uh, because they don't have enough employees to operate when the federal mandate takes effect. And that's despite them reporting on the Hill today that 94% of their employees are vaccinated overall. Um, Amtrak got $66 billion from the infrastructure deal. Now they're talking about having to make cuts. Is this policy undermining the president's own legislation? Well, first I would say, and you touched on this, Jackie, but it's great news that 94% of Amtrak's workforce is vaccinated. That is an enormous percentage of their workforce, to state the obvious. They also still have uh, about a month uh, before the deadline for federal contractors on January 4th, or at least a couple of weeks, four weeks approximately. Uh, our, what, we, what we have conveyed to uh, employers is that post-deadline, we expect employers will follow their standard HR process. That means if for employees not in compliance, they'll go through education, counseling, accommodations, and enforcement. That would be what the process would be to play out. But of course, uh, these requirements, uh, we don't expect these requirements will cause disruptions to services that people depend on. There's some time to implement it. Uh, we're, of course, working with all federal contractors and, and federal employees and, and, uh, and parts of the federal government uh, to implement this moving forward. And on Ukraine, there are some reports that the U.S. is pressuring Ukraine to cede land to Russia as a way to deter them from invading. Is that true? No, that's absolutely false. Jen, go ahead. Jen, thank you. Staying on Ukraine, Russian troops are still amassed along the border. Do you have any indication at this point that the president's strategy is working? Well, Kristen, I think it's going to be up to President Putin to make a decision about uh, whether he is going to invade Ukraine uh, uh, and, 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 and send a message to the global community that he does not respect the territorial integrity of a country when the United States, our European partners, are sending a clear message that there will be significant economic consequences, severe economic consequences, beyond, as Jake Sullivan said the other day, what we have seen in 2014. Uh, so at this point, obviously, you would know if they have made the decision to invade. They have not. Uh, but again, it's, it's the ball and is in his court. And we know that Ukraine, some lawmakers on Capitol Hill have said that they want more military equipment now. I know we don't have a readout yet of the call, but are there any discussions about potentially sending that equipment now and not waiting until there's further invasion? Well, there is equipment that we're continuing to provide. Uh, that is a follow-up from uh, the President Zelensky's uh, meeting with President Biden back in so September. So that is something they're continuing to receive. And of course, there are a range of uh, options under consideration, uh, but nothing I can preview at this they point in time. More. They're basically saying, yes, that is the case, but given this current situation, they actually want it. Absolutely. I understand that, and they've conveyed that publicly. I don't have anything to preview at this point, uh, but certainly we have been 
a strong supporter of not only the sovereignty of Ukraine, but also through security assistance, and the President has a long record of that. I think one just domestically on the child tax credit, and really just following up on the question that April was asking. Yeah. Are there any discussions about potentially pulling that piece out of Build Back Better and passing it unilaterally as a standalone bill if Build Back Better doesn't pass by Christmas so that there isn't a lapse? Well, I think April, I don't know where she went. Okay, there she is. I was pointing to her in the ether there. Um, April raised an important point here, which is that December 15th would be the last uh, child check uh, from the child tax credit uh, because it would expire January 1st. Uh, one of the reasons that we have been pressing for the passing of uh, the Build Back Better is because there are key components of this package that would lower costs for American families early next year. So when we talk about inflation and we talk about costs and how they're impacting families' budgets, that's why we, Leader Schumer and others, have been pressing so hard to move this forward. In terms of the mechanics of legislative vehicles, I'd really point you to the Senate on that. Uh, but again, uh, you know, that is a timeline uh, and that is something that we are well aware of. And to go back to, I can't remember who asked the question before, maybe April, maybe Jackie, I'm not sure. Uh, it is true that in part because of the child tax credit, we cut child poverty in half. Uh, I'm not an economist. I can check and see if there's more predictions of what the impact of the lack of existence of that would be. But that sends a clear message about the impact that has had on low-income families, on families who are struggling to put food on the table. And it's been a pivotal uh, contributor to our, our success in doing that. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I just want to circle back to the President's comments yesterday about NATO allies. He said that he hoped by Friday he would, quote, be able to announce meetings at a higher level, not just with us, but with at least four of our major NATO allies and Russia to discuss the future of Russia's concerns relative to NATO writ large. Are these meetings, conversations not happening? And, and if not, what was he talking about exactly? Well, he has a call with the B9 uh, this afternoon. Uh, that's something that includes a number of NATO allies. And of course, we are in touch every single day with a number of NATO allies and partners. And as I noted a little bit earlier, uh, when, he, when he had the conversation with President Putin, they discussed and agreed to have their teams follow up in ongoing discussions and engagements. In terms of any other format or forum, uh, there is no uh, current mechanism for that. Um, but right now, our focus is on engaging with our, the Europeans, many of our NATO allies doing that at a very high level, as the President referenced, and also following up, as was discussed in his call with we President Putin. expect some kind of announcement tomorrow about some sort of conversation with the sort of entities he's talking about, about accommodation. Not one that I have pred to predict at this point in time. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Catherine. Go ahead. Um, the president uh, today spoke about global press freedom during the summit. Yeah. Just wondering if he's going to commit to holding a year-end press conference. Well, one, I, I would say that global press freedom uh, is something that he uh, feels is important to stand up for, not just here, but when he is uh, traveling around the world and ensuring that your colleagues around the world uh, who are dealing with circumstances where uh, they don't, they are put in jail, uh, they don't have access to any officials, uh, they are restricted from covering uh, uh, global events, human rights abuses around the world. Uh, not that what you don't all, all do isn't very challenging. I'm not suggesting that, but there are a lot of circumstances around the world that I think even go beyond. Uh, go beyond. Uh, I would say the president answers questions multiple times a week. Uh, I think he's done it already several times this week. I don't have a formal press conference with embroidered cushions to predict for you at this point in time, but I can assure you that he will take your questions many, many times before the end of the year, and he looks forward absolutely to doing that. Go ahead, Josh. Can I just ask quickly on Iran? I yeah. Mean, you spoke to measures you're preparing. Are there particular sectors that these sanctions would be aimed at, or can you give us any more detail about what options are on the table? Sure. Certainly understand your question, Josh. I think part of the effort of our uh, OFAC director and going overseas, going to the UAE to have these discussions is to uh, have these discussions at that level about the, ran the range of sectors and options, but I don't have anything else to preview at this point in time. Concerned that existing restrictions are being violated with regards to this trip, that people are finding a way around existing? Uh... We're talking about, we have kept the sanctions in place. We're talking about additional steps should they be needed. Obviously, a diplomatic path forward and having a constructive dialogue through the P5 plus one format is our objective, but we're we're preparing a range of options in addition to what we have in place. Did any of the P5 plus one other than 
Uh, That's part of our discussions, and this is part of the the our OFAC director's trip is building on uh, conversations uh, that Brett McGurk, that Jake Sullivan, and others have been having in Europe as well. Can Go I ahead. Just, just a quick some, question on um, just real quick question on the, the democracy summit. You sure. mentioned the four hundred twenty four million dollars. Yeah. Do you have a sense how much of that is already appropriated versus how much would need to be approved from Congress? Uh, let me check, Scott. It's a really good question. I don't have that in front of me, but I will check for you and I'll get that around to all of you after. Yeah. Go ahead, Ashley. Two very quick questions on Ukraine. One, why did President Biden immediately call top US allies right after speaking with President Putin and waited two days to call President Zelensky? Uh, he was traveling yesterday, I think, as you all know, uh, and he was looking forward to having a good, uh, lengthy call with uh, President Zelensky today, which I expect he will do. I would note that we also followed up with Ukrainian counterparts uh, at a lower level than the president. Uh, so it was just a matter of scheduling and uh, getting it all on the books. And yesterday, the president also said that uh, combat troops on the ground in Ukraine are currently off the table. Um, can you give us a sense of what would change that calculation when they would be back on the table? That's not currently part of our discussion or part of our policy calculations, so uh, I don't have anything to predict on that front. Go ahead, Dolan. Thank you. Uh, oh, on Afghanistan. Um, there's, uh, in recent days, some parolees or people seeking parole have started to be denied um, who are looking to flee from Afghanistan. Uh, I understand this system has been flooded with, I think, roughly 30,000 applications, but some of the lawyers for those parolees or applicants have said that the documentation requirement, including specifying an address or a specific threat, given that it might have been 10 years ago or their home might have been destroyed, uh, is a pretty high standard. Is the president currently satisfied with this system of humanitarian parole, or is there any thought of lobbying Congress for another special parole program? Well. Here, here's what we're doing. I, I know you didn't exactly ask me this, and you follow this closely, but for others, um, through Operation Allies Welcome, we're proud to have welcomed more than 74,000 Afghans to the United States and have received funding from Congress to accept up to 95,000 through Operation Allies Welcome through the current fiscal year. So obviously what we're doing now is continuing to process through through a vetting process and through and there are requirements of that of course as there should be uh, that's in addition to Afghans who are admitted through the U.S. refugee admission pr program and other pathways. You touched on this Zolan a little bit, but the infrastructure to support refugee resettlement was decimated by the prior administration. We've been working hard to rebuild that capacity. I would say the success we've had to date of welcoming that number of people is a reflection of the fact that we've made some progress in that regard. And right now DHS is processing applications for Afghan nationals located outside of the United States who are seeking humanitarian referral based on urgent humanitarian need or significant public benefit reason. There are going to be requirements, of course, through any of these systems, as there should be, as we consider welcoming people back in. We're continuing to uh, put in more resources so that we can process more people uh, and continuing to uh, try to take do everything we do can can do everything we can, I should say, sorry, to handle the surge in interest and in cases. Uh, but there will be people who don't meet the requirements who aren't going to be able to come to the United States. And we just want to be very clear and transparent about that as well. Oh, no, uh, with the Demac with the Democracy Summit again uh, at a CNN town hall, the president uh, was asked about voting rights, police reform. He said that he had been so focused on build back better and infrastructure, but that he was going to move on to that, indicating he would move on to that. Uh, now that we are moving, you know, you've had some progress with that legislation. Is there any update towards whether he would be more open to a filibuster carve out, or just what exactly is he doing when it comes to those two uh, legislative measures, given the summit going on? Sure. Sure. Well, well, one I would say, as the president, as you heard the president say, uh, you know, having a summit like this is an opportunity to discuss how we can all improve our democracies, protect uh, democracy around the world, and do that in coordination with not just leaders, but civil society actors, private sector, etc. That's the purpose of this summit. There are dozens of White House staff working every single day on voting rights and this priority. It's fundamental to upholding the rule of law. You've heard the president talk about this many times since he took office. He signed a historic executive order in March. We've worked to double the voting rights staff in the Civil Rights Division. He's appointed the Vice President at her request to lead this effort. There are discussions, as you know, in Congress among a range of leaders about how to continue to move this forward, and we are uh, eager, active participants of those discussions. I don't have anything more in terms of views or his steps on the legislative process at this point. Don't have any updates today. Okay, I got I to gotta, I gotta wrap in a second. Let me go to AFP. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you very much.
Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. One on Russia, well, one, one on Ukraine, yeah. and one on China, if I may. Um, could you tell us a bit more about President Biden's, how President Biden views Putin's central argument, um, which seems to boil down to they they don't want Ukraine a to enter NATO, but b also not to have any U.S. offensive weapons um, or NATO offensive weapons in Ukraine. So when President Biden referred to looking for accommodations, was he talking about cutting some sort of deal with Putin about we won't do this if you don't do that? Let me be very clear. President Biden told President Putin in their call that one nation can't force another nation to change its border. One nation cannot tell another to change its politics, and nations can't tell others who they can work with. Uh, we've consistently expressed support for the principle that every country has the sovereign right to make its own decisions with respect to its security. That is written into the underlying principle of the alliance, and that remains U.S. policy today, and will remain U.S. policy in the future. Uh, as you know, NATO is a defensive alliance, uh, and they don't have aggressive intent toward Russia. They've conveyed that. Leaders of NATO have conveyed that. Every we step we have taken is to put in place the protective measures needed to defend our allies. So that, just to be clear about where the president stands, that is what he conveyed directly to President Putin. And a quick one on China, yeah. this, uh, the Olympics at least. Um, would uh, President Biden like European allies to join this uh, diplomat diplomatic boycott um, initiative? Is he dis disappointed in the French very publicly not doing so? And, and just more generally, uh, you know, if you're going to talk about genocide in a country, which is you know, right, right, right there in the statement, is playing sports at all a kind of a reasonable thing to be doing? Um, why stop at a diplomatic boycott? Well, well, first I would say this is the decision we made, the United States made. The United States has been a leader in holding uh, China accountable as it relates to human rights abuses, uh, the, what we've seen in Xinjiang, uh, which again the President and we have referred to as a genocide. Uh, and we have taken steps at the global level to lead this effort to put accountability measures in place. As it relates to the Olympics, uh, we made a decision, the President made a decision, that we cannot continue with business as usual, that not sending a diplomatic delegation was making that clear not just to China, but to the global community. There are others who have followed that uh, same pattern uh, and have taken that step as well. We leave it to other countries to make their own decision. I'm not going to express support, disappointment, or anything like that from here. They will make their own decision. And I will also just paraphrase, and I wish I had the quote in front of me, Senator Romney, uh, where he said, uh, and he, his quote was better than this, so I'm a paraphrasing it here, but that uh, we cannot leave global diplomacy on the shoulders of athletes who have been training their whole lives to compete in the Olympics. If you look back at 1980, and there was a boycott, all of those people who trained for the Olympics, uh, it was left on their shoulders, uh, young athletes who have been training their whole lives. We are sending a very clear message about our view on human rights, but we made the decision not to leave that on the shoulders of athletes. Uh, let me just go to Raquel, and then we got to wreck up. Raquel, go ahead, Raquel. Can, can, we, let, can we let Raquel? Simon, uh, Simon, Simon, I, Simon, I'm trying to answer your question, and then I'm going to go to Raquel. Okay? Uh, let me. Uh, can I say one thing, Raquel, and then I'll go to you? Simon, we're evaluating every single day. We don't want these to be permanent measures, and and it is something that the president is getting updates from his COVID team every single day on. The, the Omicron variant is now in 57 countries. The WHO issued a statement today and said that Africa has 46 percent of the nearly 1,000 cases globally, but 70, almost 70 countries in the world have imposed travel ban on only black African nations. And the U.S. is among the countries that have imposed sanction on only eight African nations when the, when the variant is in 57 countries. Why don't you just lift it or impose sanction on all the countries that have it? What will you say to those who, who believe that this is a racist ban that target only African and black African nations? Simon, I would convey to you that is absolutely not the intention. That is not our policy. This was a recommendation of the health and medical experts because there were a, l a large number of cases in South Africa, and they made a decision early on out of an abundance of caution and to protect the American people to slow the spread of the variant. This is not meant to be permanent. It's not to meant to be a punishment. And we are evaluating every single day decisions on whether to when to lift these restrictions. Go ahead, Raquel. Thank you so much, Jen. Since Go ahead, Raquel. Since day here today in the White House, what is the White House assessment so far from what you guys are hearing uh, or fr uh, from world leaders and the commitment they are making? And also, what commitments would President Biden like 
to see from Brazil and other countries experience right now forms of democratic uh, backsliding. What is uh, President Biden expecting to hear from President Bolsonaro tomorrow? Well, I would say first that the, the president convened the summit uh, in order to uh, have a forum at a global level uh, to discuss publicly, but also privately. And he convened a private discussion with leaders this morning to engage, listen, and speak honestly about the challenges and opportunities facing democratic governments and how democracies can deliver for their citizens. And part of this is an opportunity, as I noted in my opening, to stand up for uh, the freedom of speech, the freedom of press, uh, for ensuring that as a, as a global community, we are lifting up democratic society we are fighting corruption, we are bol bolstering democratic reforms. And the United States wants to be a country that leads by example um, and builds and repairs from the damage done for four years. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate you. Have a good day.